It's good to see you, and it's always good to be able to come together to study as we uh, continue to make our way through one of my favorite books in the Bible, which is called the Book of Acts. And there's just something very special about the book of Acts. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, might find ourselves attempted to different action figures. their time and so Jesus was very patient with his disciples and his followers during his public ministry and then we find that Jesus was very patient with them after he went to heaven and he sent his Holy Spirit and he was continuing to guide his church his apostles and his disciples when you think about it, really, Jesus was introducing, uh, when he brought in the new covenant, he knew in his mind, because of course he knows the beginning from the end, doesn't he? And Jesus knew that he was introducing the, what would become the second great world religion. Now we have three great world religions today that have evolved over the last couple of thousand years. And um, well, the, even before, if you count Judaism. So Judaism, of course, had uh, uh, conceived with Abraham many years before Jesus. Then Jesus came along with his disciples and they had conceived uh, Christianity. And then about 500 years later, we have Muhammad that rose up and also uh, brought in the third great world religion, which is that of Islam. And so Jesus was introducing the second great world religion when he began his public ministry. You know, there's, a, um, there's something I've been sharing with my friends over the last, well, a couple of decades now as I've been studying the Old and the New Testament and realizing that there is more parallels and more in common between the Old and New Testament than there is different from the Old and New Testament. In fact, it was so many parallels that I started to say, you know, I'm gonna write a book one day called There's Nothing New in the New Testament. And, uh, and really, of course, this is uh, something that flies into the face with that, of that which has evolved in a lot of, of what we call modern evangelicalism. Over the last 50 or 60 years, we have this kind of uh, evolution of two gospels. You have the gospel of the Old Testament, which is more works-based, you kind of, you know, merit-based uh, uh, salvation, and then you have the grace-based salvation of Jesus in the New Testament. And that just doesn't really fly when you read the Old and New Testament and realize that uh, really they have way more in common than they have not in common. Now, of course, there was a couple of different things that were clarified with the New Testament, and so we need to be fair when I say that. When there's nothing new in the New Testament, we have to say that in an overall sense because God did clarify a couple of different things that he winked at in the Old Testament. I'm thinking in, in particular of that of, of uh, polygamy. You know, he kind of winked at polygamy throughout the Old Testament era, but then when the New Testament came along, he said, okay, listen, this is... Uh, a new standard that I want to introduce. And so he said, when you pick your deacons and your elders and so on, make that example and be the husband of only one wife. And, uh, and so he kind of clarified that for us. Adornment and jewelry, you know, Peter and Paul clarified that issue more than any other uh, writer up until that point. And so, yes, there's some new standards and new clarification that God kind of brought God's people up to speed on. Um, but overall, the really... More than anything, there's nothing new in the New Testament except for one very significant thing. What would that be? All right, Jesus. All right, now Jesus, and we can say in a way, was, it was the center of, of the Old Testament covenant, uh, the Old Covenant or Old Testament, even as he was the New Testament. Um, so yes, to a certain degree, but what... What is the large minus? There's one large removal from the Old Covenant. No, it's not the Ten Commandments. Okay. All right. All right. Now we're starting to get on to the answer. Okay. We went from warm to hot to right on the dot. And, uh, and that is that uh, we find that 
uh, you know, there was the removal of the ceremonial and the civil law of Moses. Was that a large removal? Yes, that was a huge removal. And so there is one very significant difference between the old covenant or testament, excuse me, and that of the new covenant or testament. And that is the fact that there is a fulfillment of Christ in his life, his death, his ministry, and his high priesthood in heaven uh, that replaced all of that priesthood and earthly sanctuary and sacrificial system and so on here on earth. And, uh, and, and so this is no small difference between the two. And uh, the civil was removed, why? Well, because Israel was going to soon be morphed into a borderless nation. Um, its citizens would no longer be bound uh, to a, a, a bordered country, but rather Israel was now to find itself morphed into an international uh, existence. And so its citizens would find itself eventually living in all nations around the world. And so logistically, a civil government just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit, it's not needed, and therefore that civil law of Moses was to be set aside. Not only that, but the ceremonial law was to be removed. Um, why? Because its purpose was fulfilled, as I said earlier, in the life, death, ministry, and high priesthood of Jesus. Now, one of the things that we need to keep in mind as we come to Luke, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the book of Acts chapter 15, is that for the fledgling church that was predominantly by far, almost pretty well exclusively Jewish um, by race as well as by religion, um, we find that for the fledgling church, uh, this was not an easy pill to swallow. For many, this was like cutting off their arm, or at least it felt like they were asked to cut off their arm because uh, this was a big part of who they were. I mean, the little, the, the, the men, the women, they can remember that first time when they were able to make that pilgrimage with their families down to Jerusalem at 12 years of age and, and participate for the first time and, and observe the temple and the great sacrifices that were taking place and the, the great ephod with the Urim and Thummim and the, you know, the, the, the great gems on the chest of the high priest, you know, they, they, they saw all that and they, they made deep impressions and, and, and this was a very intricate, very important part of their religious experience and understanding um, of God's salvation of, of their religion. And, uh, and so this was not a small transition that God was bringing them through. And that's why we find it didn't happen in a day. We find it didn't happen in a week. It didn't even happen in a year, but it, it took several years. In fact, it took a few decades for the church to be able to come to full terms with not only the fact that uncircumcised Gentiles can come into the gospel without being circumcised, come into Israel without being circumcised and observe the law of Moses, but that the law of Moses itself was fulfilled and even for the Jew was not necessary any longer. And, uh, and so step one is found in Acts chapter 15 and then the rest is found throughout the rest of, of, uh, of the decades that followed and, and, um, and really it wouldn't be until the book of Hebrews came along. Now the book of Hebrews wasn't written when the Jerusalem Council took place. They were just coming to grips with uncircumcised Gentiles coming into the church and into the kingdom and into Israel. But, uh, um, but then there was also the uh, question of, uh, of, of even a Jew not being required you know, to keep the feasts and, and so on. And so that's why you find that most Christian um, that are also Jewish uh, by background uh, you know, they, they don't keep the feasts or the sacrifices. In fact, really nobody does, does they? Do they? Um, because uh, to keep the biblical feast and the sacrifices means that you have to, you have to draw blood. And, uh, and so nobody's really drawing blood anymore, are they? There's no sacrifices of animals that are taking place. There's no high priest. There's no priesthood. There's no earthly sanctuary. All these elements were necessary to be able to keep most of the, uh, the annual feasts and, and so on that are found in the Old Testament. So the book of Hebrews was to come years later, and of course the book of Hebrews was the great treatise concerning the fulfillment of the ceremonial law 
of Moses in Christ. And uh, the book of Hebrews is instrumental because it declared most extensively the elimination of the sacrifices. It is the great, long thrust that it gives to the church that uh, is to explain that the earthly priesthood, the sanctuary, um, which is included in all the daily rituals, the annual feast days, and so on, uh, was fulfilled in Christ. That it was a copy, that it was a shadow of the heavenly things, of the true, of the better. In fact, I want to invite you, and this is kind of a long introduction, I know, but I think it's important for us to be able to look at Acts 15, or at least helpful, to look at it in the larger context of the New Testament and, uh, and to be able to see that um, in a helpful way in concern to the ceremonial law of Moses. So come with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Now Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, those four, those four chapters in particular. Now the whole book and you know, the, the main gist of the book and, and main purpose that God inspired the book was to help, uh, uh, well, there's a number of, a couple of different things, but one of the main things was to, was to uh, demonstrate that uh, the, the ceremonial law of Moses was fulfilled in Christ. So uh, chapter 8 and verse 13, uh, Paul sums it up here. If you're like me and you believe that Paul was the one that wrote the book of Hebrews, in verse 13 it says, In that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so he summarizes that what is growing old is ready to vanish away. Now notice how God's mercy and grace is there. He's not saying, listen, you need to cut this off right now. Um, in fact, he didn't even give the book of Hebrews till a few decades after, uh, a couple of decades, the evidence or so after the Jerusalem Council. And even then he's not saying, listen, you gotta just cut this off if you're a Jewish believer, no. He's saying it's becoming obsolete, it's growing old, it's ready to vanish away. God is giving time for the Jewish believers to be able to let this part go and understand its great fulfillment in Christ. And uh, no longer is the blood of bulls and goats required to be brought before the Lord, but now the blood of Jesus Christ, the high priest in heaven, is the one that we bring to him as our sacrifice, as the one who cleanses us. Verse 8 in the ch next chapter, chapter 9, and verse 8 through 10 also says it in a very powerful way. It says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. That's the earthly one. It was symbolic. What was it, friends? It was symbolic for the present time. That's in Paul's time, the church's time, all the way up to now. For the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience concerned only with food and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the what? Until the time of the Reformation. When is the time of the Reformation? Now don't get this confused with the Reformation of the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, no. He's not making a prophecy into the future 1500 years, no, he's talking about his time, isn't he? Starting with Christ's ministry who was laying the groundwork for the New Testament. Christ died on the cross. He sealed the New Testament with his own blood. He became our Passover lamb. He became the sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for the sin of all of mankind from Adam all the way to those of us who are living when Jesus comes again. And so we find here that, that Hebrews is uh, kind of summing up and finishing up what is started in Acts chapter 15. And, uh, and so for now, and by the way, the book of, the book of Hebrews, uh, you'll find that the word better is repeated over and over as you go through that book. And, uh, and the reason is, is that God is trying to convince the Jewish believers that, hey, I know that what you had was good, but now I'm giving you something even better. You know, yes, the sacrifices were divinely ordained. They were given, they were my idea to bring the lamb, to bring the bull, the doves, and so on. But now I have something better. I have my son, you know. Yes, the earthly sanctuary was magnificent in, in, in its glory, and it, and it spoke volumes of spiritual truth to you and so on, but now I have something even better. It's a heavenly sanctuary. It's larger, it's more glorious, and it even speaks more volumes of truth in a powerful way. 
And he says, yes, I know I have an ordained an earthly priesthood. Um, and the priesthood was important. It was my idea, but this was symbolic. It was a, it was a shadow, a copy of, of something better that's in heaven. It's, it's Christ, the priesthood. He's the beginning and the end of the priesthood. And so this is something that is even better for us now. And, uh, and, and so it's, 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 it's shown in the powerful, true light that it really is designed for us and for the early uh, Christian Jews to be able to understand. But for now, God seems to be opening the horizons to, to more to see that the law of Moses, uh, including that of the rite of circumcision, was not required for Gentile believers to come into Christ, to come into Israel. Um, in fact, it's interesting that baptism didn't really come up until about John the Baptist, at least in part of God's plan. And so John the Baptist was laying the foundation for a new initiation into Israel, into salvation. And, uh, and now long, no longer is it circumcision, but it is it's baptism, isn't it? Yeah. So he initiated a new physical ceremony to enter into salvation in a physical ceremonial way. And so it's my hope that today's study will help uh, some of us who may be watching, who perhaps have uh, mistakenly come to conclude that, that, that to, for us to be faithful Christians, that we need to, to come back to the annual feast, that we need to be able to keep the Passover feast, that we need to keep the Feast of the Trumpets and so on. And uh, I know some very sincere Christians. In fact, a family member of mine for years uh, was convinced that this was necessary. And again, you know, I gently tried to share with him that, you know, listen, um, you know, even if it was true, um, you're not really keeping the Passover anyway. Because to be a Bible Passover keeper, you have to bring a lamb that's one year of age without blemish into your house for 10 days before the Passover, get to know it, then you have to slit its throat, you have to take its blood, you have to put it over the lintel of the, uh, and the side of your doorpost, you have to then you know, take the, the lamb and you have to roast it whole, you know, uh, and, and then you need to be able to take that meat and, and much as your family and household can eat, you, then you eat it and whatever's left over, you, you burn it by morning. Um, I haven't met anybody yet. Now, maybe there's some small group over in Israel somewhere that I've never heard of that is doing that, but I haven't met or heard of anyone or a people group in the entire planet that's keeping the Bible Passover today. And, uh, and, and that's okay. Why? Because the good news is that God has given us something better. That Christ is our Passover lamb. And, uh, and, and so the law of Moses and the ceremonial law of Moses has been fulfilled. And so Acts chapter 15 is, 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 is confirming that for us. It, it's clarifying that issue for us in a very powerful and needful way. And so the book of Hebrews and the chapter 15 in Acts are exhibit A and demonstrating that uh, that keeping the feasts is, is not the case. God, God has, has fulfilled that. It was a copy. It was a shadow. It was symbolic as we read in Hebrews chapter 9 and uh, the ninth uh, verse there uh, earlier in our study today. Well, that being said, we don't want to run out of time before we get into Acts chapter 15. Um, we're going to review a little bit. Two weeks ago, we looked at uh, chapter 11, and we were studying the ministry of Peter, and I had the privilege of being able to teach us as we looked at that important subject. And as we looked at uh, uh, chapter 11, we discovered that Peter found himself arriving in Jerusalem with uh, kind of a, some cold shoulders uh, from his fellow apostles and from his elders. And the reason was that uh, rumor had already spread to Jerusalem and preceded Peter's arrival. And, uh, and the rumor was that Peter had lowered himself to enter into a non-Jewish home, a Gentile home, and, uh, and not only eat with them, but also preach to them, and then of all things, baptize them. And, uh, and, and so the leaders in, in Jerusalem were horrified. And so they kind of jumped on him as soon as he got into the city and said, is this, is the rumors true? And so poor Peter had to go into uh, defense mode and he began to recount how he received this amazing vision while he was on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner in, in Joppa by the seaside. And, and this amazing sheet came down with all these unclean animals and God says, rise, kill and eat. And three times he refused and after the third time God rose the, the vision up and Peter scratching his head afterward and saying, what in the world did that mean? And in the meantime, there's some messengers that come and, 
in, from Caesarea just up the coast and say, hey, listen, there's a, a, a Roman Gentile by the name of Cornelius and he's received this vision from God. He sent his messengers and a soldier to come and get you because he's been told that you have a message for him and the Holy Spirit tells Peter, this is true. And so Peter goes on the way up to Caesarea and, and, uh, and, and he's still trying to figure out what the vision means. And, uh, and then when you look at Acts chapter 10, and I think it's around, well, let's take a look here. Because that uh, verse is so important, I just don't want to guess. Acts chapter 10 and verse 28 we find that uh, Peter confesses to Cornelius and says, listen, I have to confess that I don't feel comfortable here and I was trained all my life to say that this is wrong, it's unlawful, and uh, I shouldn't even be in here, but God has told me in the meantime through this powerful vision that I should call no man unclean or common. And, uh, and so Peter reveals the vision and the meaning of the vision at that point. And so he goes ahead and preaches and break out in the, in, 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 in this, in the gift of tongues and begin to speak different international languages and tongues uh, just like they did on Pentecost. And Peter looked at his cohorts and he said, well, this is, this is, this is the same gift that God gave to us when we were preaching to all the different uh, uh, pilgrims that came into, into uh, Jerusalem for Pentecost feast and, 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 and spoke in all these different languages. And, uh, and so surely the Lord is, is with this and behind this and, and so what prevents us from baptizing them? And so he went ahead and baptized Cornelius and his household. And so Peter shares all this with the religious leaders and, and so we come to uh, the, the conclusion of the matter and we have a volunteer that's gonna be reading Acts chapter 11 and verses 17 and 18 as we review that today. Thank you. Acts 11, 17 and 18. If therefore God has given them the same gift as he has given us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Okay, so here we have Peter in verse 17 and then there's that, that, that Dramatic silence, that pause in verse 18. What is gonna be their conclusion? Are they gonna see the light? Like Peter is coming to see the light? And sure enough, they said, well, then God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. And so this was a revolutionary but very needful conclusion and truth and light that went on in the minds of Peter and the apostles, the Gentiles and so on. And they realized that, hey, you know, uncircumcised Gentiles can come into the new covenant. They can be baptized and not circumcised and they don't have to observe the law of Moses. They can come in and, and yes, of course they are coming in to uh, obey God and Paul goes on extensively about that throughout his letters and so we don't have time to study and talk about, uh, you know, God's will and concern to the Ten Commandments and, and, and all these other wonderful things that God has for the believer to follow. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we find that uh, this was a revolutionary step uh, for them. It's also important for me to point out that uh, a proper interpretation of Acts chapter 10 and the vision that Peter received is essential for us to understand the workings of Acts chapter 11 as well as the workings of Acts chapter 15 because in both those chapters, the vision comes up again, doesn't it? And both those chapters, we find that when the vision comes up, Peter doesn't come up and say, oh, by the way, uh, God has also revealed to us that we can eat pork, you know, and, 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 and we can eat unclean foods and God has cleansed all, all the clams and the, and the lobsters and, 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 and unclean stuff that, that we used to be told to avoid. Um, it doesn't say that, does it? No. Instead, it says that God has told me that we should not call any man unclean or common. And so twice, three times the interpretation is given to us in Acts chapter 10 itself in verse 28. Acts chapter 11, we find the same thing is given to us in verse nine. And then when we come to Acts chapter 15, we're gonna discover that it's there as well. And so three times it comes up, three times the interpretation is given, and it's important for us to understand what it really means because it has a critical application and it's a very needful application.
Well, after Acts chapter 11, we kind of said to ourselves, and it's natural to think to ourselves, that the matter was settled once and for all. After all, these were the apostles and the elders that had concluded this with Peter, right? And Peter was the apostle to the Jews. He was the ultimate representative that God had assigned to represent and to minister to the Jews. And so if God was able to first bring this light of truth to, to Peter's mind and then bring it uh, through him to the rest of the elders and the apostles, why, it was, a, it was a settled matter. But it would be over two years before the conclusion of the matter would make it into the, into the church manual. Uh, before it would become policy, become, before it would become official church doctrine that would be on paper, in print. And so this is a process, again, that God is bringing his church slowly but surely in the right direction with, and his grace is there to be able to help them to be able to see that and come to terms with it. Now, one of the things that's fascinating between chapter 11 and chapter 15 is that uh, Barnabas is in Jerusalem still when Peter comes and explains himself and defends his baptizing of Cornelius in his household. And so he almost for certain was in that council and in that conversation. And he heard the conclusion and was a part of that conclusion. And so we read that shortly after that, he was sent up to the city of Antioch. Now we say up because it's north, but you'll find that when we read it in the Bible, it says they went down to, they went down to the city of Antioch. When you look at the map, you say, well, wait a minute, Jerusalem's way south of Antioch. He, they went up. Um, and that confused me for the longest time. And then I found out that it's, it, it, you know, for the Jewish mind, Israel is on a hill, and it is on a, on a bit of a hill and a mountain. Um, uh, but it's the holy city, it's the capital, it's the ultimate. And so whenever you left Jerusalem, you went down to wherever you were, whether it was north, south, east, or west. It didn't matter which direction you went. You were going down, you were descending from the holy city. And uh, so even when you go north, you're going down to the city of Antioch. And so uh, he was sent up to Antioch to investigate the conversion of these different Hellenists. Now these were Jews that had become just as much Greeks or maybe even more Greek than they were Jewish as far as their tradition and even some of their religious practices and, and so on. And, uh, and, and they were hearing the gospel and, and they were receiving the gospel and they were being baptized. And, uh, and Barnabas was excited about that. Then he makes his way over to Tarsus. He picks up Paul. Paul comes back, and for a year, they're just preaching and just, just a powerful, powerful year where they're baptizing all these different, uh, yes, Jews, but also Hellenists and, 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 and probably even some uncircumcised Gentiles. And, um, and then they eventually pair up together, both Barnabas and Paul, and they went on their first missionary trip. And as they went on their first missionary trip, why, very naturally, they started to preach. Yes, it says in the different synagogues, and, and certainly there was a number of Jews that were coming into, into the gospel of Christ and accepting him as the true Messiah, but they were also baptizing a large number of uncircumcised Gentiles as well. And Barnabas and Paul were doing this freely. Why? Because Barnabas was in Jerusalem when Peter came in, and they had that conversation, and they had that informal conclusion that indeed repentance to life is given also to the Gentiles, even uncircumcised Gentiles, and they too can be baptized. And, uh, and so it makes sense why Barnabas and Paul went out so freely as they were ordained and then authorized and, and sponsored by the Antioch church. And so we come to uh, Acts chapter 14 in verse 27, and we have a volunteer that's going to read the last two verses of that particular chapter in Acts 14. Acts 14, verses 27 and 28. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. Okay, so here we have... Um, a, uh, um, so here we have... Uh, uh, Paul coming back, and of course, uh, you know, they didn't have slides like we do today. There was no PowerPoint. But if they did have PowerPoint, they would be clicking away like we would, you know, and, and, and showing the different slides and, and showing, you know, this is what we did in Derbay and Lystra and, and these different cities. Now, when you look at the map in some of the back of your Bibles, you'll see that the first missionary trip didn't go out very far. The second and third one, they went way, way out. First one, they're just kind of getting their feet wet, and they go out, and, and they kind of circle back uh, quite a bit shorter. Um, 
But when they come back, they're just on fire for the Lord and they're just so excited to show all the pictures if they had pictures and, and of course they didn't. But you know, they're just, so, they're, just, they're just so excited to share all the wonderful things that God had done through them. And, uh, and it says there in verse 28 that they stayed there a, a long time. Now how long is a long time? Okay, that's what I ask myself. You know, it's a kind of open-ended question, isn't it? It's more than a week? Uh, I think we could probably all conclude it's more than a week. Is it more than a month? Yeah, probably. Uh, you know, it was at least several months and maybe a year or two. I don't know. It just says a long time. And so even when they got back, they continued to grow the church in Antioch and, and continue to evangelize and things were going well until we come to chapter 15. And uh, in chapter 15, we find that there's a self-appointed contingency that comes from Jerusalem and arrives to stir the waters. And I'm going to go ahead and, and read verse, uh, uh, actually verse 24. 15 verse 24. Now I know that's jumping ahead. And verse 24 is the letter that the uh, Jerusalem Council had eventually written as they wrote this new policy and doctrine and belief of the church. Verse 24, it says, Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And uh, so it's, I think it's important for us to understand that the, that the group that uh, had arrived from Jerusalem in the city of Antioch uh, were self-appointed. And, uh, and that's a good lesson for us. You know, it, I've never seen things turn out good when there's a self-appointed member or a self-appointed group of, of members that decide that they're going to go off and, and teach a, uh, something that's maybe contrary or different than the church's teaching on their own without going through the proper channels without uh, working with their local pastor and conference and so on. And, uh, and, and this is no exception. This is a good lesson for us um, that it didn't turn out well. So certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, it says in, in verse 1. And maybe I'm going ahead and taking a volunteer's uh, text. I think I am. Chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, please. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, thank you. All right, so Paul and Barnabas didn't take kindly to the, uh, to the agenda of this particular group that uh, had arrived in the city of Antioch and, and so on, and uh, they could have handled this in a number of different ways, but they handled it in the proper way, didn't they? They handled it in the healthy way. Um, and that is they said, okay, well, let's just not try to solve this locally. Let's go down to, let's send a, a representative group down to the leadership of the church. And we could kind of say that Jerusalem was the GC, uh, you know, the headquarters of the church uh, during this t era. And, uh, and we'll uh, bring it before the brethren and the leadership and we'll decide together. And we'll bring back the answer back to you. And so that's what they did. They started to make a journey on the way down. They made some pit stops on the way down, reporting and such, and then they were received in verses 3 and 4. We pick it up in, in verse 5, and I'm just going to go ahead and read verse 5 through 12 as we look at that. It says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so... Some of these likely represented local Pharisee and Jewish believers that lived in Jerusalem. Some of them may have been also representative from the contingency that had uh, gone up to Antioch and now had come back down with Paul and Barnabas. Um, and they're agreeing and they're saying, I think it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the, now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us 
that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, before we go on, I just want to point out a little bit there in verse 10, you know, that kind of show, reveals again that for Peter and the apostles, the, you know, the law of Moses was something that was godly, God-ordained. And, uh, and, but it felt like a yoke because the traditions of the fathers, the Jewish fathers, had been added to that so extensively and, uh, and it skewed it so much in a lot of different ways that it felt like a yoke. And so that's why you have that more negative connotation there. In verse 11 it says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And then all the multitude kept Silent. There's that, just like verse 11, I mean chapter 11, remember? Chapter 11, there's that dramatic pause, that silence. Then all the multitude kept silent. And then they listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And so here we have Peter for the third time giving us uh, the interpretation and the reason for the vision that he received in Acts chapter 10 with the animals of the unclean animals and creatures that were found there. And that is that God was teaching them and bringing them up to speed that, that indeed the gospel was intended for Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles as well. And so it's very important for us to understand um, this truth. Well, James then goes on and makes an appeal to accept Peter's testimony and then verifies it with a scripture as he quotes from the scripture and so on. And then he proceeds to make a motion. And, uh, and we could find that motion in the same chapter, verses 19 uh, through 20. And so we'll just ask a volunteer to go ahead and read that for us. Thank you, John. Acts 15, verse 19 and 20. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Okay, thank you. So there's his motion. And uh, uh, when we come to verse 22, it says the conclusion, it says, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who also was named Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And so they chose these different representatives, both the ones that came from Antioch as well as local Jerusalem representatives, to be able to take the letter, put it in print, officially bring it up to Antioch, and to be able to have that as their new official stand as a church. And, uh, and so the majority had, uh, were in agreement. They formally put it into print. And also it's interesting in Acts chapter 16 verse 4 we find that Paul then took that letter and he used that to bring it to the other churches he had planted throughout the Roman world as well. And so it didn't just stay in Antioch, it was used extensively after that by uh, the missionary work. By the way, does this all sound like organized religion? It does, doesn't it? Okay, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because sometimes, sometimes we have mistakenly come to a conclusion that when we come into Christ, that, uh, that Christ uh, at least gives us the option to be able to kind of be a lone ranger kind of um, a Christian. And, uh, you know, that God has called us to kind of be isolated lone rangers and we just kind of do our own thing and we worship God by ourselves, we serve God by ourselves and so on. And, uh, and some people have a real hang up about organized religion. And I want to make an appeal uh, to those of you who perhaps uh, struggle and maybe have been stung by organized religion and, and you have some different issues or hang-ups about organized religion and and yet when we read the Bible uh, we find here that organized religion is very very biblical it's God ordained it's God's idea it's it's his it's his plan for all Christians to come together as a body and that's why Paul paints it as a as a head Jesus is the head and then we have the body and the body is is the makeup of all the believers and they come together every Sabbath and to worship, they serve together, they encourage each other. Um, and so uh, God is into organized religion. And the Bible makes that abundantly clear, especially in this chapter. Um, and so there's protocol. Uh, 
there's hierarchy, there's, there's, there's leadership that is in placement as God has ordained and, and appointed different people in their different gift appointed positions and so on. And all of that, when it's done it with the Holy Spirit, with sincere believers, all works to the glory of God and, and benefits the world and brings the light of the gospel to the world in a very powerful way. And uh, so I want to recommend that none of us, if we're, if we're bashers of organized religion, that uh, yes, sometimes organized religion can be very negative. Um, but find the right organized religion. And when you do that, uh, you know, uh, like Granite Bay Church and, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, I, I thank God for the organized church and, and the blessings that he gives to me and, and to all who are involved with it. Well, I wish I had more time to continue to study because this is just such a powerful chapter and there's much more that we can draw out of this, but our time is up here today and I do, I do want to remind you that if you would like to study further on spiritual Israel, we refer to that during our study here today as we made our way, as Christ brought us as believers from the old covenant to the new covenant. Um, there is a spiritual Israel that continues to exist and uh, we have a free gift that we can offer you that you can bring home with you and or uh, have sent to your home. And so just uh, call 1-866-788-3966. That's 1-866-788-3966 and ask for free offer number 174, Spiritual Israel. And you can also get a digital uh, download for that on your phone. You just have to text SH-Z or Z, I should say, E R O. 6224-0544. I hope that's on the screen for you as well because that's a lot to be able to take down. God bless you. Love you all. We'll see you next Sabbath. Okay, well, that concludes our Sabbath school study here.